Our scripture passage today comes from the eighth chapter of the epistle to the Romans, the 12th through the 25th verses. Listen, hear, and receive God's word. So then, brothers and sisters, siblings, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Recently, I became aware of a reality series on ABC called Claim to Fame. In this show, people who are not famous live together over the course of several weeks, attempting to keep the identity of their famous relatives a secret while trying to guess the identity of the other people's famous relatives. It is intriguing that so many not so famous siblings, nieces, nephews, cousins, children, and grandchildren are willing to play this duplicitous game of lying, cheating, forming alliances, and selling others out in order to gain some notoriety, fame, and fortune for themselves on national television. Everyone playing the game must keep up a facade, pretending to be someone other than who they truly are, and maintaining their cover story for weeks, all while living in the house with others. I guess it's all worth it because the last person who is successful in maintaining their secret, the secret identity of their famous relative wins $100,000. I'll share that the first season, Kiki Palmer's sister won the $100,000. <laughs> Second season is on now if you want to catch it on Hulu. <laughs> now, while writing this sermon, I wondered whether we are hiding our true identities as we walk in the world. Do we hide behind the words we speak or leave unspoken? Does our willingness to serve or not or the way we treat or interact with or dismiss, dismiss others belie our true identities as the adopted people of God, heirs and joint heirs with Jesus? Please believe that I ask myself this question of myself frequently. Although I don't always agree with the Apostle Paul, I can relate to wanting to do good while evil all, is always present and might be an alternate choice. So I'm not pointing fingers at or accusing anyone else. I know firsthand that it is easier to see the speck in the eye and to miss the law of God in my own. Paul this 
dispatched this letter to the Jewish and Greek Christians residing in Rome, most likely because there was dissension and internal strife between the church, as the members were Jews, proselytes, and other non-Jews, many of whom were not native to Rome. The church was mixed across social strata, largely drawn from the lower classes, including free and enslaved, enslaved persons. Anytime people gather and have different culture and social realities, lived experiences, and people who speak different languages, anytime people who speak different languages get together in the world or in the church, there's bound to be trouble, or at the very least, misunderstandings, misinformation misinformation and different world views. Can you imagine trouble, strife, dissension, and disagreements in the church? God forbid. Now, now that we have established the fact that there is or can be dissension and unrest in the church, we wrestle with why is that? Is it because we fail to remember or even know who we are now that we have received God's gift of salvation? Although the world is still a place of brokenness, division, sin, and unrest, the Spirit of God is still working, leading, guiding, and protecting our lives so we might live faithfully as the children of God, heirs of the kingdom of God. We are loved beyond measure and have every right and privilege of our brothers and, and Savior, Jesus Christ. One commentator writes that adoption is a powerful metaphor. It is an act of grace. The fact that God has chosen us and incorporated us into a Christ-shaped family composed of people, end of quote, of every ethnicity, race, age, economic, and educational strata, status, it is powerful. By adopting us into the family of God, God has literally destroyed or broken down barriers that exist between us and has destroyed and made inconsequential all the rhetoric, the issues, and the reasons we espouse that separates us from one another or that causes us to think that we are above or better than others. We collectively are the family of God, and our adoption status creates an intimacy between our shared, between us in our shared status, and gives us the right to call God Abba, Father, Divine Parent. In an earlier chapter, chapter in Romans, Paul shares that in Christ Jesus there is no longer Greek or Jew, slave or free, male and female. Yet we know that Paul, being the complicated person he is, also wrote, slaves obey your masters. And Paul told women to be quiet. Good luck with that. <laughs> and subjected to your own husbands. Paul, like life and us, was complicated and contradictory. You know, we say we love one another, and our actions, our conversation, our inactions, they speak and exhibit other truths. We say we are one family, and we shy away from people who are racially or ethnically different, economically or socially challenged, people who identify sexually other than we do. We say we love God, and the only evidence of our love of God is when we gather on Sundays to worship. But the rest of the week, the way we walk in the world denotes everything but a worshipful existence. One commentator noted, 21st century America is coming to resemble the era of Jesus' first followers in provocative ways. The church is no longer at the center of Western society. Attendance in the mainline churches continues to decrease. Christians are increasingly on the margins of our society, freed more than ever to become the counter society Paul calls us to be. You know, when you're on the margins, you're counter to. Amen? Whew. That's a shout right there. That we are marginalized. And so we can be who God is calling us to be because we don't care about the culture.
this is an era in which Christians more than any other time in decades can understand ourselves to be an alternative community to the destructive ways of life embraced by larger culture, close quote. As the already adopted children of God, we have the right, the responsibility, and the indwelling of the Spirit of God to live as faithful examples of unconditional love, acceptance, and inclusion. As the already adopted children of God, we have the right, the responsibility, and the indwelling of the Spirit of God that leads us to treat others with respect and to demand justice for all of God's people. As the already adopted children of God, we have the right, the responsibility, and the indwelling of the Spirit of God to be corrected when we are wrong and when we go astray or when we wander off path. Kath Reen Lesher Brown writes, Paul uses the language of adoption to remind us that we are not all on our own, forging our own path. We are adopted into the family of God, which might look different from the family we would have chosen for ourselves, but whose bonds in Christ are even more powerfully forged. We are joined into a family where God is in charge, not us. We are adopted children, not loners. We are heirs, not creators. We are debtors, not investors. We are not people who can skate through our days pretending to keep our hands clean. As a matter of fact, I suggest that as God's people, we keep our hands dirty and our hearts clean. We are the ones who are scandalous and sinful and in desperate need of God's grace. Close quote. Beloved, this may be hard to hear, but it can also be freeing. Being accountable to a God who loves us and engrafted us into the family of God, it can be scary for those of us who want to be or think we are totally self-sufficient and, are, con and are comforting to others who are thankful that everything no longer depends solely on them. When we discover and truly internalize that we are bound by the one who knows no bounds, we are hemmed in by the one who gives us reason to hope, we are released from believing that success or power or even just getting through the day is all up to us, then we are freed from thinking that we cannot fail. Get that, cannot fail. Because we can fail and we do fail. We have failed and will fail again and again and again. And that is the good news. Because we are claimed by God in whom there is no failure. Amen? So now what? How shall we live? No longer hiding our identities, pretending to be someone other than who God created us to be. We live with the freedom to trust God so we can enter into difficult conversations about race and economics, class and institutional structures of discrimination. We live knowing that we may be taken advantage of at some point, but trusting people anyway, because in the economy of God, even when we lose, we win. We live knowing that we will rock the boat and upset people, but standing up against self-righteousness, injustice, and sin anyway because Jesus, our brother, rocked boats and overturned tables and traditions. We live knowing that we will ache and grieve and cry sometimes <laughs> along this journey, but we have the assurance that we are not alone because the Spirit of God is always with us. This week, some of you may know that I had the privilege of attending the Black Theology Leadership Institute at the Princeton Theological Seminary, the other PTS, the original ones down the street. And while there, I realized, and the Spirit of God confirmed, that it does not matter who does or does not like the way I carry myself as a woman called by God to preach the word of God. It does not matter who has labeled me as an angry woman of African descent or who attempts to discredit my witness. 
I know who I am. I know who I am and who God has called me to be as a black woman. Amen. Claimed and called beloved daughter of God, doing my utmost to love as I am loved by God. To pastor as I am pastored. And to speak truth to power because I have been empowered by the indwelling spirit of God. And the only thing that truly matters is that I am able to stand before my God. Knowing that I have done my best to embody who God called me to be and what God has called me to do. I refuse to hide or compromise those things any longer. Beloved, we can choose to hide in plain sight and live hemmed in and held back by the fears and failures of our lives. We can choose to pretend to be someone or something other than who we already are in the sight of God. Or we can choose to stop hiding, taking on alternative identities and personas and live fully into our identities as the adopted children of God, the offspring of God, the siblings of Jesus the Christ, hemmed in on all sides by love and held at all times by our loving parent who has already claimed us as their own. Now that's our claim to fame. That's our claim to fame. We are the children of God right now in this moment. So let's not get it twisted. Amen.